Hello, I'm Jodie McAllister and I'm an author. So this is Libby Lawrence is Good at Pretending. Uh, it's the fourth book I've published, but it's actually the first one I ever wrote. I, it was my draw novel. I wrote the first draft when I was 20 and have rewritten it from the ground up four times. So I had written two full drafts of it before my first novel, Valentine, was even a glint in my eye. So I wrote the first draft when I was 20. And at that point, I was a theatre kid. I did a lot of community theatre and I had a lot of emotions. So it should come as no surprise that the book I wrote was about theatre kids <laughs> with a lot of emotions. So in Libby Lawrence is Good at Pretending, Libby is a member of a campus theatre group, group, the Terravale University Repertory Society, or Unirep, as it is called. And she's been there for a little while. She's in second year. She's done a few productions, but she's nearly always been in the chorus and had non-speaking roles. Then there is a regime change at Unirep uh, for like quite bad reasons, though it works out in Libby's favor. Uh, a new director comes in and in their next production, Much Ado About Nothing, Libby gets the lead. But throughout the course of the book, even though she's thrilled that she's got this lead role, she has to grapple with one of her worst tendencies, which is that she kind of performs the role of herself rather than actually saying what she wants a lot of the time. And so her journey in this book is about, A, being a good actress, but also learning how to say what she actually wants out loud and not just what she thinks people want to hear. And also there's a romance in it and some lovely friendship stuff and ensemble and theater. And it's a lot of fun. That makes it sound very serious, but I promise it's fun. My publisher for this book is Wakefield Press, who are a little independent press who are based in Adelaide. So I have jumped around in terms of genre. So my first three books are a trilogy, the Valentine trilogy published by Penguin. And they were young adult, paranormal romance, urban fantasy, kind of that territory. Louis Lawrence, on the other hand, we are in contemporary here. And rather than it being kind of traditional, I hate the word traditional, I'm a historian, it covers a lot of sins, but rather than being a traditional young adult novel with the protagonists in high school, which the Valentine series were, in this one it's set at university. Libby is 19 and the characters range from uh, first year undergrad through to honours. My target audience for this is kind of the upper young adult into university, though I think anyone that's ever done any theatre will, will find something to like in this book. Uh, I don't think Libby is for everyone, but I think for the people she is for, she is really for. There are some people who are gonna see themselves in Libby, I think, or at least I hope if I've done my job right. <laughs> I am not a full-time author. I am also an academic. I work at Deakin University, which is just down the road from the Leaf Bookstore where we are filming this. I'm a senior lecturer in writing literature and culture there. And so I have this whole other life as an academic. I've published two academic books, uh, The Consummate Virgin and New Adult Fiction. And uh, I've got another one, co-written one, coming out later this year, uh, publishing romance fiction in the Philippines. Uh, but I study representations of romantic love in popular culture, and I'm also really interested in how genre fiction works, which explains why I've written a lot about romance novels, but that is not all I have written. I have also written a lot about soap opera and a lot about, a lot, a lot, a lot about The Bachelor, which is fed into my book, which is coming out in July. It's a two book year for me. Uh, Here for the Right Reasons is my adult debut, and it is a rom-com set on a TV show, which is definitely not The Bachelor. Okay, my question here is, have you ever had writer's block? Yes, I wouldn't say I'm a horrible sufferer of writer's block, but I have had it. And I think the reason I don't suffer from it like chronically or over much is because I've learned some tactics to deal with it. And the number one is walk away. <laughs> like there's only so far you can get staring at a screen. If something is just not working, walk away, come back in half an hour, come back in an hour, come back in a day. Things always seem better after you come back to them with fresh eyes. Lots of people helped me to get this book over the finishing line. Um, much like community theater is an ensemble, there is a secret ensemble behind, the, behind this book. So when I was writing that very first draft, back when I was a little baby, back when I was 20, uh, I had a, a writing group. My friends Hannah and Monique and I were all writing and I was living on campus and they were living in a share house about a suburb away from campus. And every time I finished a new chapter, I used to tell them and they used to be like, Jody, come around for dinner. And they would share their chapters and I would share my chapter. 
and we would talk about it. And so they read Libby almost like it was fan fiction, <laughs> serially, chapter by chapter. But instead of fan fiction, maybe I should compare it to Dickens or something. <laughs> but like, they read it like serial fiction. And they've read many drafts of my book over the years. But as I've drafted it and redrafted it, I've shown it to different people along the way. This iteration, the person who really helped me get it over the finishing line was my literary agent, Alex Adset. Um, there were a few things I wanted to do in this book and that I was very married to. I was a little bit too close to this book in some ways because it was so important to me. And, you know, she had some hard conversations with me being, you know, and said, look, I know you love this, but this doesn't work. No. And my editor at Wakefield as well, Joe Case, had some of those conversations with me. Like, I know there is this section that you love, but it is not working in this book. That's why this book has no epilogue. I wrote one and I love it so much, but I got overruled and I think it was the right decision. Uh, I think the moment that a lot of authors dread is that moment when you get a letter back from your editor. One, because you're like, oh no, this is gonna be so much work. Uh, and also because like, Criticism is hard. I mean, it would be so nice to get a letter back that was like, this book is perfect, Jody. Change nothing. Here, we've sent you some wine and some flowers. You're great. Everything is great. Um, sadly, though, that would not make you a better writer. So I think that moment where you have to see all the work that you have to do, you have to learn not to take it personally, that it's about the work, it's not about you. That's always the hardest, but it's like, it's like the writer's block question. You walk away and then you come back, and then you come back to it with clear eyes. The Jodie that wrote version one had so many emotions and she was so sincere. And I don't think like current Jodie could have written this book without that very first draft. And when I was writing version four, I went back to that first draft, much more than I went back to versions two and three actually, um, because I wanted to capture some of that, that authenticity that rawness that lived in that very first draft. So in this book, Libby is 19. I was 20 when I wrote that first draft. So Libby and I were, were peers. And this is not the same book as the one I wrote when I was 20. That one was 250,000 words long and had a lot of ridiculous side plots that no one needed. And for those who didn't know, 250,000 words is two and a half of these. This is about 100K. Um, but little Jody had to learn how to write. And so I'm glad I could take what she wanted to do, that I've grown into myself as an author, and I'm satisfied that this is coming out at the right time, that there didn't have to be a version five or a version six. I, I think I've got it now. Yeah, I do, but I try not to read other books in the same sort of subgenre, like very, very specific subgenre. So obviously uh, if I'm writing contemporary romance, I'll read other contemporary romances, but not ones with the same conceit. So for Libby Lawrence, I wouldn't read other theater books. For Valentine, I wouldn't read other fairy books. I still haven't read any of Sarah J Maas. Um, for, for Here for the Right Reasons, my July book, I haven't read other Bachelor style reality dating show books because I, I don't want I don't want to A, like accidentally borrow someone's ideas, but also I don't want to be too influenced by those ideas. I think they can take some of the, the freshness out, particularly when you're working in genre fiction where fresh takes on tropes is so important. Uh, I, I want to be familiar with the genre, but not necessarily the specifics of what's going on in my field. Oh, we can talk about my July book. So here for the right reasons, my adult rom-com debut published by Simon and Schuster. So we've got another publisher in play there. This was a lockdown book. I wrote this very, very different writing story to Libby Lawrence. I wrote the first draft of that one very, very fast in the uh, lockdown in 2020. And it is a rom-com set on a dating show, which like I said, is definitely not The Bachelor, uh, but with one important twist, which is that for various pandemic related shenanigans, it's not a pandemic book, just the pandemic sort of exists in the backdrop, but because kind of hardcore lockdown restrictions come in on the first night, no one can leave, including the eliminated contestants. So Here for the Right Reasons is a rom-com between The Bachelor, who's called in this world the Romeo, the show's called Marry Me Juliet, and a contestant he eliminates on the first night. 
And then the follow-up book, which is out in February next year, called Can I Steal You for a Second, is uh, it's set on the same season, concurrent with Here for the Right Reasons, and it's a romance between two of the contestants who stay, who are front-running contestants. They, they come quite close to the top. So you've got two interwoven romances, two love stories taking place at the same time, but two separate books. And they are a lot of fun. They are big and spectacular in some of the ways where this one is like a little quiet and psychological at points. Those ones are drama, 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 ridiculousness, spectacle all the way. What am I reading at the moment? Uh, I have just finished reading, I read a lot of contemporary romance currently, uh, which feeds into, I'm currently in the edit phase for Can I Steal You For A Second? So I mean that generic space, but not that reality TV space. But a book I just finished, which I loved with all my heart was Love At First by Kate Claiborne. So her previous book, Love Lettering, got a lot of praise. It was very highly acclaimed in the romance world. And so I bought Love at First like very quickly and then it sat on my bookshelf for about a year and a half before I picked it up. And then I did and it blew my mind. It's such a beautiful contemporary romance. I think Kate Claiborne is one of those writers that I don't write anything like, but I really wish that I did. The the levels of kind of interiority and emotion she can communicate in her characters um, through showing, not through telling. It's not like she's telling you every single second what they're feeling. She just shows you. It's a, it's a gift, honestly. And sometimes the pace can feel quite slow, but with her you don't notice because she's just such a beautiful writer. That's an interesting question. Have any of my characters surprised me? Yes. Uh, and in this book, in particular, the villain, Nightingale. So when I, he kind of haunts this book for a long time before he actually turns up. And the, the sort of the premise behind Nightingale is the idea that we read so many books that are full of charismatic bad boys who turn out to have a heart of gold. What if one is charismatic and charming, but actually just is the worst, just, really is terrible. He really is what everyone says he is. And I had a lot of fun with that premise because I think that's quite an interesting question. But because he doesn't turn up on page for such a long time, because he haunts the book, uh, he ran the risk of being a little bit one dimensional, of being this kind of like a boogeyman in the text, being like, "Ooh, I'm still here and I'm bad. Um, but the way this book is structured, which is something that I maintained from that first draft when I was 20, is that it's divided into kind of five acts because they are putting on a Shakespeare play and Shakespeare has five acts and like teenage Jody thought this was extremely clever and uh, current Jody just decided not to change it. But the book is mostly in Libby's perspective, but to divide these acts, there are these little interludes from other characters' perspectives. And one of them near the end is from Nightingale's perspective. And that was so difficult to write, but also, very surprising to write as I had to kind of come to grips with who this terrible man was and make him seem like a person rather than just like a, a cartoon <laughs> boogeyman. And I think it's good for the book that Nightingale has some complexity without sacrificing the fact that he is just like, I cannot even communicate to the extent to which he is the worst. <laughs> he is a horrible person but kind of grappling with his reasoning and figuring out what that was, that on occasion surprised me. And it was really hard to write, but there were moments where it just kind of slid out of my control. And I was like, oh, that's how Nightingale thinks. Oh, it was there all the time. That's his logic. It really does work. And he's still terrible. My goodness. I hope no one reads this book and comes away with the idea that, oh, Jody should write a Nightingale book next. He's so sexy. <laughs> What was or were my favorite children's books ever? Well, there are, there are two answers to this. So there is very young Jodie and then there is kind of slightly older Jodie. Very young Jodie taught herself to read on Enid Blyton books. Um, I, and I think many people probably like loved Enid Blyton as a child, but the first book I ever wrote, I was six years old and it was called The Mystery of the Advent Calendar and it was a distinct Enid Blyton ripoff. I'd been reading a lot of Famous Five, Secret Seven, that kind of thing. And it was two pages and 20 chapters long. And my parents have a recording of me reading it somewhere, which is of course very embarrassing for me. 
Uh, but when I got slightly older, a book which was hugely formative to me when I was young was Over Newton by Isabel Carmody. So my primary school librarian put it into my hands when I was nine and I devoured it. Thankfully, the next two in the series were out. And then I was like, okay, what's next? And she was like, there, there is no book four yet, Jodie. And I was like, oh no. And it came out when I was in year eight. And I don't know if you've ever seen a copy of The Keeping Place, the fourth one, but it looks like a phone book. Like it's huge. And so I tore my way through it. And then I was like, oh no, how much longer do I have to wait? Can't be that long, surely next year. And the next one didn't come out till I was like well into university. So it ended up that I read these books from the age of nine to the age of 30 when the series ended. Uh, like I've got friendships that are based around reading these books. Uh, my original like writing group, uh, my friends Hannah and Monique and I, when we weren't talking about our own books, including the first draft of Libby, we talked a lot about the Open Newton Chronicles <laughs> and we had theories and all kinds of things going on. So they're a series I really, really grew up on and they are so near and dear to my heart. Well, the next thing for me is of course Here for the Right Reasons out in July followed by Can I Steal You for a Second out in February. So the next 12 months have three books in them for me. So May, July, February. I had to edit all three of them at the same time. That was, I don't remember what happened in February and March this year, to be honest. It's all a blur. And then after that, I'm hoping to write a third one in the Bachelor series. Um, this will all depend on whether my publisher lets me or not, but I'm very much hoping to. And then I hope to continue kind of straddling this um, young adult, adults line to kind of go back and forth between the two. Um, if people like Libby, I would love to write another another little book set in the world of uni rep. I think Ella, who is Libby's best friend, has certainly got some stories left in her. But also on top of this, I am a full-time academic and probably I should do some research at some point this year, um, given that I don't remember what happened in February and March. Uh, probably I should do some academic writing. Oh, it has been my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.